fact, invited all our founding anchor partners uh, to submit reflections and questions relating to concerns, issues, and suggestions uh, with regards to you know, the Open Education Resource University initiative. Um, for the benefit of, of those participating remotely, uh, we would also like uh, to receive questions uh, from folks who are, are watching what is happening here live. And you need to do that by posting to your preferred uh, micro blog account using the hash OERU tag. And, and Jim Titzler will be monitoring the feed and any questions that do come from uh, our international visitors uh, who are not present here today, we will feed into the session. Uh, we will also welcome questions from the floor um, regarding you know, um, the issues we, we will need to address in this meeting. So it's really about you know, finding the common ground of uh, the challenges we are going to need to uh, start resolving uh, over the next two days. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to hand over the uh, facilitation of the session to Dr. Robin Day. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Ryan. Um, we do have questions that you have already um, submitted and comments and stuff like that. Um, having had a look through those, they tend to be grouped around particular, particular themes. Um, and one of those themes is the, around the relationships uh, between different levels of um, institution, pathways. You know, we have um, Empire State uh, you know, and Thompson Rivers that covers quite a wide range of provision, we have polytechnics, we have universities, um, and within this OERU context there's been quite a few comments around that, so perhaps just to start the session off, um, I might ask the panel first um, if they have some thoughts on that, and I know for the, the USQ uh, had some uh, particular questions there, Jim, perhaps you might start there, and then if you have questions from the floor, please, please come in with those, because these questions are questions to be submitted in the case. Uh, I think the issue of uh, different levels, uh, sort of cross-sectoral uh, training from um, what we would call vocational education through higher education and then undergraduate and postgraduate was an issue that was raised at our university. Um, we're pretty open-minded about all of these things and I think that's the other essential issue that as we work together we need to keep an open mind and try and accommodate the interests of uh, all of the participating partners. Um, one particular emphasis in USQ is to start with the undergraduate level of provision and especially those people who are presently excluded. I think one of the figures that Fanny Durain is that there are 98 million people who are qualified for entry who can't get access throughout the world. So that was our particular um, orientation. And I know that some partners have expressed an interest in offering a postgraduate award. Um, at USQ, we tend to think that people often have to pay for their postgraduate award. So our emphasis is on undergraduate. I know that Nikki at the University of Canterbury, we were just chatting earlier, made the point that um, Access at the postgraduate level is also a problem in terms of financial access and other needs of access. So, while our preference is to concentrate on undergraduate work, um, we're open minded about other opportunities. Perhaps, uh, Judith, you might follow up with your experience. So, we are an institution that lives um, across multiple sectors and uh, creating pathways uh, for learners to move from one sector of education to another. And not just our own learners, but we work with um, uh, numerous other uh, universities and colleges to create pathways and articulations for their students to move from the education that they're receiving from those institutions into our programs so they can achieve their particular educational goals. So it, it's a space that we um, we know quite well. We live with, again, it's part of our founding educational philosophy of who and what we are as an institution in terms of creating um, 
opportunities for learners to achieve their educational goals. Um, I think in terms of uh, our interest in um, this whole particular project, we have uh, a multitude of levels, I think, at which we can contribute. And I think there's also a multitude of levels at which we can learn. And it's one of the, the reasons for being engaged in this particular organization is the opportunity to share ideas and concepts and in a very open um, way and to learn from each other's experience and expertise <coughs> in terms of crafting what is and what we believe is going to be the future for open education. Any, any comments from the floor? I find it really useful to know of maybe one of the hardest or unresolved issues with your experience that you've come across and if you did solve it, how did you solve it? In the particular movement in, of... In, in that, as you say, the articulation. Um, yeah. So, for example, when I, I like some examples to be able to use to tell you the truth. Yeah. So when I'm talking to my colleagues and saying, well, I've heard people say that they were open and they solved things. Um, here's an example. It would be nice to have. Yeah. So in terms of the actual articulation, British Columbia has a very sophisticated model for articulating credits across... Um, yeah, its institution, so being able to take courses um, and credentials at a college level and moving them on to all of our universities, not just Thompson Rivers University, but University of British Columbia, Sun Fraser University. We have a very um, sophisticated um, articulation system. We are a part of that system, and again, we've made uh, these ar arrangements. The difficulty in articulation in general and the acceptance of credits um, really, in my opinion, requires us to move away from the notion of the focus being on the content and moving to the notion of the focus being on the learning outcomes. And whether or not, it, it really shouldn't matter whether a student has, you know, studied this particular piece of content, but whether or not they have achieved, achieved the broad learning outcomes that you're looking for, either at a course level or a credential level. And if you focus there, again, you can um, assess for yourself. You'll have your own legitimate vehicles for assessing and, and um, validating that, that that learning outcome has been achieved. But in doing that, you can then stand behind the articulation that you're granting and the credit that you're giving for that learning that's happened outside of your own institution. Does that answer your question? Yes. Ron, I'd just like to add to the comments as well, because, because we're not a teaching institution and we have no students, I can be quite candid. Um, and I, I, we have heard critique uh, from the outside. How, how can you call this the Open Education Resource University Initiative? Because we are a collaboration of community colleges, universities, um, uh, polytechnics uh, from around the world. And uh, you know, I, I think that's why the model is so powerful, um, because we have, can have a shared infrastructure building on existing practice. Um, Thompson Rivers University had a laddering process between associate degrees and, and, and full degrees, and the, the system works very, very well. And I think what a, an international collaboration like this does is brings that model to play in a cross-border international context, and, and we can all work with each other's strengths. Um, and as, as Nikki said, the foundation stone of what we are doing has to be based on quality and credible credentials. And that is something which I think we as a partnership cannot compromise on. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think they're just exciting opportunities. And just to say to that, um, from the polytechnic perspective, and of course, each of us from our own perspectives is, are operating in the context of what we are able to do. And so we were able, as the Polytechnic and the Polytechnics are able to award qualifications up to doctor, although there's only one Polytechnic that does that. We still have the Masters and, and the, the big majority of our courses are bachelor's degree. And so it behoves us to make sure our quality assurance process, our standards, our credentials are at the right level, like it's national and national and our credible is one and the same. So, you know, there isn't an issue in that regard. So you have to look behind that, what is the issue? And the issue is one about perception of credibility, I think. You know, and we have to make sure that we build that the platform that says as a collaborative group, 
um, that, that we have this credibility through the collaborative partnership, through the strength of the model, through the quality processes that we're going to be talking about, you know, the, the models and things that we were built to ensure that, uh, that people, well, they can say, you know, that was a lot of value, but it's easily refutable. And we have to work through mechanisms to do that, I think. Now, how, how do you need to tackle the challenge with the, the emerging of the, you know, the polytechnics and, and, and the university? Well, uh, the merger took place uh, within the context of quite a lot of reform, the level of the regulatory framework as well. Uh, so we established a new qualifications framework, a new qualification authority, uh, and we've only just approved after lots of contestation uh, the uh, higher education qualification framework. Now what this makes possible is uh, articulation between different institutional types and different kinds of programs, so your vocationally oriented programs and general academic uh, oriented programs. Each of them has a niche on this entire qualification framework. So it's possible to work one's way all the way up to a doctoral qualification uh, with credit accumulation. <coughs> And we, uh, we have quite loose boundaries between the various institutional types uh, because we have now, uh, we used to have uh, the equivalent of polytechnics, we used to call them technicons. We now have transformed them into universities of technology. So they have the status of university, but they still retain the vocational orientation and applied research orientation. Uh, that raises their status, brings them closer to universities, and makes it also makes it easier uh, for mobility between the uh, various qualification types and the institutional types. Then we have six comprehensive universities, and UNISA is one of the comprehensives. So this would be a university that offers both vocationally orientated programs as well as general academic programs from certificate level right up to doctoral level. Uh, so, again, within the internal policies and uh, qualification structures and so on, uh, the boundaries are far more blurred that you'd find in other systems. Very importantly, I think that, uh, and this, this will be a challenge to uh, the network, uh, is the, the cross-border uh, accreditation and qualification, uh, quality assurance uh, regimen, because we find within the South African system, uh, because we have quite an evolved and sophisticated quality assurance uh, system, uh, at the course level and at the institutional level, there's quite a lot of uh, focus on quality assurance. So you, you have minimum standards being met right across the board, and there's a regulatory authority that looks at each program is approved uh, and brought under sharp scrutiny before it's approved. So all of these contribute to the mobility of the between. Did you have a comment, Jean? I was just going to say that, because uh, we often talk about this in the context of our prior learning assessment and recognition uh, process and program, that um, you know, we get questions, because that is, at TRU, transfer credit is um, credit that comes to us from another accredited post-secondary institution. Everything else that comes through our prior learning assessment and recognition process to be reviewed for credit assessment. Um, and we're often, um, you know, we will often get questions about how can we, uh, you know, say that this particular learning um, experience or opportunity that has happened outside of the academy in a very non formal way can be recognized for academic credit. And our response is always because we are the people making the assessment, it's our standard. It's our outcome that we've articulated, that we are saying has to be met, and it's our process for validating that that standard has been met. That's how we can accept it for academic credit. Um, and we see it as equivalent to um, the same uh, way of achieving the, that, that learning through a lecture-based classroom experience. And it's, it's no surprise that a key number of the stakeholders here have extensive history in yes. assessment of prior learning and the lessons we've learned through that, mm -hmm. yeah. and so they can be applied. And again, I, I think a significant feature of the OERU model is the fact that institutions retain their autonomy. Um, so the, the model works because individual institutions uh, need to adhere to the policies, procedures that are on campus um, when operating with this network. And, and, and so I think that's a, 
A strong feature for future success is the fact that we're not trying to invent new policy or new processes, but taking the point of departure that let's start with existing policy that we have within our existing institutions and get to work within you know, existing institutions. So you know, I think that's a strong foundation for future success. And, and, and as the model matures, sure, we're going to learn new things. And, and we might need to uh, tweak and refine policies in the future, in the long term. And you know, that's got to be good for all. I think the other key is in, and I don't know how everyone else's prior learning assessment uh, or recognition prior learning assessment process works, but we've built a very um, rigorous, transparent, documented process. So uh, for any um, questioning of credit that's been given, we're able to go back through a process where, and multiple people in independent assessments are done of that. Um, credit that's been granted. So again, it's it's rigorous, it's transparent, and it's documented. Cool. Any other any other comments on this on this trip? From uh, just from Athabasca's point of view, it's really a non issue we we accept community college we have um, uh, agreements with pretty well every community college in Canada. And so we just accept the credits on our, if it, they get two years community college, they get two years at the basket. And uh, it's a non-issue. It's a non -issue. Uh, I'd say almost a non-issue because uh, if they're going into particular programs at the basket university, then they have to show that they're community college courses. If they're going into the business school, they have to have business courses. If they're going into chemistry, they have to have chemistry courses. But that's the only the only issue that comes up. Otherwise, they're just accepted as credits across the board. And in fact, even if they're going into business, they'll accept the credits across the board, but they'll be told you have to take these first and second year business courses as well. Okay, I think um, might, I might move on then and into some discussion around the pedagogy. And um, one of the uh, questions that came up, or another questions came up around pedagogy, and as we're talking about um, a credential and then courses within that, then the question arises around um, all the different pedagogies that we have and use and are comfortable with, and how that how that sits within within the model. So perhaps I'll just open that up to the panel. Is there anybody who wants to take that one on? Just to say an opening comment, having spent a life in pedagogy and in both the university and polytechnic sector, we really find agreement on <laughs> optimal pedagogy for, for teaching in our classrooms. So and, and I think this is an interesting challenge for the network in terms of how we take it forward. Yeah. Well, I, I have a very strong opinion on this that we just keep out of it. It's got nothing to do with this sort. The OER, it's up to each institution and each, inst each professor in each institution. I, I think it would be a, a mistake for us to get involved in it. I, I think we should stay out of pedagogy and let, leave that to each individual because it's so different. You're just going to get into huge arguments about what is and how this type of constructor is and this type. And it, it becomes, it, it makes things impossible. So, so we have to build the model in a way that that's an issue that we enable pedagogies, a um, range of pedagogies. Whatever pedagogy you want, you use. Because what I found is just because somebody says they're a constructivist doesn't mean they actually teach in a constructivist manner. Uh, even the behaviorists, uh, I've seen real behaviorists and they're doing constructivist things, but they think they're being So you're getting into a... Uh, um, a can of worms that would only delay us and cause us all kinds of grief, and I think we should stay completely out of it, be pedagogically neutral. So, Rory, can I ask a question for um, So, Rory, um, if we step back a little from pedagogy and we talk more about modes of delivery, would you say, though, that we need to come to some consensus as a group on the mode of delivery in terms of are we talking an instructor-led mode? Are we talking an independent study or self-directed learning mode of delivery for what we're going to do in OERU, or, or do you can it should it just be a mix of everything? Um, uh, I I would think that it's up to each institution. I, I personally would uh, prefer and and and, uh, and recommend that we go with the self-study mode. I think that that makes the most sense for this. If if an institution wants to do something else. 
I don't know, we might learn something from them in the way they do it. So again, I don't think we should be prescriptive in that way and, and say that, but I would strongly recommend that the self-study mode, and that is certainly the way we would learn. Well, I'm happy to end also sort of a realistic uh, approach and not get bogged down about it, but uh, I do think we need to have a discussion around open pedagogy, partly because it's on the agenda this afternoon and I'm speaking about it. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'll save my ammunition for then, but uh, I think we can learn from each other. And uh, the fact that we're going to base our pedagogy on open educational resources demands a bit of a rethink. Uh, but having said that, I don't think there's any particular model that we would endorse. Hopefully we can have a range of alternatives, but also I think uh, there's a need to move pedagogy beyond traditional pedagogy. And I'll talk more about that this afternoon. Yeah. I think it would be a lost opportunity not to have pedagogy as part of what we do, agreeing with a range of um, pedagogies being not being prescriptive, but making it open and transparent what we're talking about. And here I'm saying open and transparent is true. This is what I think we've missed is uh, helping students understand the design behind the course. So it's in some ways a metacognitive approach. Um, but it's open design, that's what I uh, took to be the meaning behind the word open design in the body of, of logic. logic model. Okay. Well, I, I think that uh, there are two particular areas we need to give attention to. Uh, the, the one is uh, that many of our institutions are on some trajectory of development or evolution on the mode of delivery. Uh, you know, uh, it could some uh, that are struggling are still in print, largely print based, others blended, others well advanced along an e learning uh, trajectory. So, depending on where we are located, there, uh, there are different capacities at our institutions. <coughs> so, I think that if we uh, don't give attention to it, we, we may just find uh, that we are locking ourselves uh, at, a, at the wrong level of development. Uh, you cannot uh, talk about uh, developing this concept without looking at what kind of capacities do we need to develop because I think that that will be a corollary to any, any such initiative. Uh, that we need to we give careful attention to the kinds of capacities that we want to develop among contributors, uh, which may demand uh, particular templates for courseware development. Uh, you have to have some idea of how it should be done how do you standardize it so that uh, you make it a coherent set of uh, resources and materials? And then, uh, once you've agreed upon that and agreed upon a common approach, uh, the uh, training that has to go in advance, <coughs> I think, will be quite important so that we have commonality across. Uh, Dr. Mamana, this uh, uh, Mumbai University has recently committed itself to uh, creating OER materials. And one of the first things we did was the group of teachers uh, who were going to contribute. I mean, many teachers were contributing to a paper. We had to sit together and decide on the mode of, I mean, how we are going to do the talking, whether it's a self-learning material. And then, uh, since these two teachers who were teaching the traditional mode, face-to-face -face mode, they had to uh, go undergo a training of what is self-learning material. So, Unless we, and then we, we went through the process of even developing a template. So unless uh, organizations sit and decide on a competitive template for a particular, uh, the kind of collaboration that we emphasize will not happen. Because everybody will write in their own way and then it will not form a coherent whole. So if we want that to happen, I mean, Organizations or groups of people working together, I think they have to structurally decide the pedagogy and the, you know, the transport and the template and all those things. And so we have to go through this process. We are still going through that process. Probably just a, a, a comment here. I think we have a, a real enabler with OER, but at the same time a, 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 a restriction. And by that I mean the real enabler is the, the licensing framework is a, is, a, is a framework of giving permissions. And, and those permissions mean that any institution 
will have total freedom to adapt, modify, uh, and, and change the pedagogy in ways that are meaningful for, for the institution. Um, so I think that's a significant enabler. The restriction, of course, is, and whether we like this or not, and this tracks back to the social justice mission, our, our core aim is to provide more affordable learning opportunities uh, for our learners out there. And there, I mean, as, as, as Jim mentioned, we are expecting an additional 98 million learners worldwide uh, in the post-secondary education system. And the economic reality is such that our network will have to find the most cost-effective and most sustainable method of, of, of delivery with the freedom for any institution to embellish and improve the pedagogy in, in a sustainable way. So, and, and I think that a natural balance or equilibrium is going to emerge, and it's very much like a capability <coughs> maturity model, that as our network matures in our experiences, uh, so, so too will our pedagogies. Any other points here? Yeah, well, what I would have is that um, if, if, as we're presenting our OER-based courses, uh, disaggregate from the supports that come around with that tutoring and, and so on, um, there are going to be assumptions built into some of our courses that need to be looked at because those will be provided as, an, I guess, as an option for the learner. So I do think that we pay some attention to that. So we have at least a common approach to the way we um, sort of clean up our courses to make them available in the system. And I, I think um, I think there has to be some commonality to what we're going to do um, at some core level. It doesn't have to be complete standardization, but some commonality because again. If we focus on our learner and we need to define who our learner is that we're trying to attract into this, there should appear to be some sort of cohesion and some sort of um, you know, notion that this is part of the OERU. Otherwise, this will just look like all the open educational resources that are out there in a hodgepodge of different styles um, and, and looks and feels. Um, that exists today. So I guess it comes back to uh, focusing on the learner and what the learner is going to see um, from, from this offering and, and how we can make this easy for them, seamless for them, um, cohesive for them. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. It's uh, um, at, at NMIT we had the National Learning Teaching Conference um, a few weeks ago and, and there were two uh, presentations that had a big impact on me. Uh, one was Mark, Mark Brown's on flexible learning, no, the other was David Roud from um, Bowd from um, uh, Sydney Technical University. Um, and uh, David's uh, presentation was around assessment. Uh, it, it sounds to me as if, if we're saying that assessment is an important part of our representation of quality, we might be missing the importance of other aspects of assessment, which is what David David talks about, and if we if we agree with that, then that does have an impact on, on pedagogy. It seems to me, so it can't be avoided in my view. <clears throat> yeah, I would never say it can be avoided, but I, I I just don't see how we're going to all agree on what pedagogy is because mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree with a lot of these uh, uh, different new pedagogies. Um, uh, I don't agree with some of the old pedagogy, so how are we all going to agree on one pedagogy? I, I just cohesive, I don't. And the learner, what learner? We're talking about 98 million people. Like, are you going to focus on what, what type of learner are we going to focus on? It just doesn't make, to, to me, it just doesn't make any sense uh, to, to, to have one pedagogy or is all paired that this, this is the right way, because I don't even believe there is a right pedagogy. I think there's many, and the strength of our organization is that we're all different, and that we have different pedagogies. And let's see if we're doing, and by the way, within my institution, I can't go around telling our professors what pedagogy they're going to use anyway. So, I mean, we're wasting our time on, on, on it. It just doesn't seem to make any sense. Yeah, I think Rory is right. Uh, we shouldn't get bogged down in clients. Uh, the greater diversity there is, the better, I think. And ultimately, uh, there's a question which is, which is very important of uh, autonomy. You can't prescribe to people what they do and how they do things. Um, at the end of the day, if we produce uh, a vast uh, repository of courseware, uh, 
I think there should be some kind of commonality in terms of the platform, the, the uh, broad uh, format for the courses and so on. But beyond that, I, I don't think we should be perspective. The, the concern that I have, that's perhaps a bigger concern, is uh, the, the overall identity and uh, character of the, the organization. The, because at the moment, all that's uh, driving it is that it's free universal education. Now, there's a lot of free material out there. And by all accounts, the take-up is not that impressive. Uh, and I think that uh, the question that generally arises is what is the motive behind it? Because the general sense is that in this market driven world, nothing is for nothing. Uh, so, the, so the best uh, you know, intentions can be uh, you know, uh, overcome by, the, by that particular sentiment. So I think um, there has to be much more that drives the the concept. I think that the name might be a problem. Say Open Educational Resource University. Is that the best kind of identity we can give to this new university? Uh, you want to convey the, the concept of a world open university, you know? So a name that's uh, given that kind of character uh, that uh, students can relate to, uh, that uh, conveys a sense of universalism. So in other words, what is the value proposition of this particular concept of this university? So we have to give careful thought to that. I think it's just taken for granted that it's self-evident. To me, it's not self-evident. And I think it certainly will not be self-evident to students. So it, it must grab students with mean, so much of choice, uh, so much of cross-border delivery. Uh, so even we, uh, as a university, where we keep, uh, this is UNISA, where we keep uh, costs to a bare minimum, uh, we are competing with 23 other universities and probably as many international providers. Uh, so the university has to be distinctive in some way. Uh, even if you're tapping into this 98 or million, uh, we must make very, very clear what the value proposition is. And it um, moves quite nicely, uh, clearly we'll have some more discussion with people actually over time, but um, the issues around the notion of what does free mean that have raised some questions. Um, so perhaps, I don't know if anybody has any particular comments they'd like to make on that. In fact, Ken Tucker made an interesting comment from, I think, Switzerland, uh, that one of the things about uh, that is in common is perhaps uh, the starting point of being able to have uh, a policy that granted free access and participation for everybody. The use of Thank, thank you for the contribution. Um, certainly from the OER Foundation's perspective, um, we are philosophically committed to both open and libre. Um, and then this comes from the open source software traditions around the essential freedoms which software should have. And the freedom we are talking about is not necessarily no cost. The freedom we are talking about are the liberties that institutions have to take decisions around the implementation uh, as, as an organized and we, we have to be realistic as, as post-secondary institutions there's a cost in running an institution and we have to ensure that our model is sustainable but the freedom that we provide is the freedom to earn a living and, and that is for institutions to earn their keep in the assessment services which they provide and that is the liberty which is so so important that we do not restrict those liberties and those foundational principles <coughs> that guide our work at the OER Foundation. And, and so, for example, the OER Foundation runs entirely on free software, uh, free and open source software. And, and there are fundamental reasons for this. It's not only about the tremendous cost savings, but it's the liberty we have as an organization to ensure future freedoms around our decision making that we, uh, we will have the freedom to, to move forward. Um, and so, so this is a, and, and it's a very valid question because unfortunately in the English language we have this problem that free refers to both no cost. 
but also the components of liberty. Um, and certainly from the OER Foundation's perspective, it's the, the freedom of speech and these democratic principles and our commitment to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which includes the right to earn a living. So uh, I think they're important concepts as we move forward. And I uh, think it's important to note one of the streams we have as we move into our work later on is open business models. So we'll be able to have an opportunity to discuss those, how they might work and how it's going out and stuff like that. Other comments on issues around fees, costs, perception of the cost? Well, I think uh, in the original concept of this, um, we saw that if we had a critical mass of institutions working together, who offered only a small number of courses. So we're not dealing with every course in the institution and every <coughs> academic. We might be dealing with two or three courses each. So for example, if we had 10 institutions, which we've already got, offering three courses, we'd start to have a, a bit of choice at, say, a program at the undergraduate level. Um, the way that our council, our university council responded to this was based on a, a slide I put up where I demonstrated that it was less than 0.5% of our courses, our active courses, subjects that were being offered. So we had the potential for a high impact innovation at very low cost. And the proposal was that the cost recovery fee, the service fee, for assessment will cover the costs uh, of the institution's involvement because clearly every institution is under pressure financially worldwide at the moment. Affordability and sustainability are key issues. So while we have this discussion, I think we need to concentrate our energies on at least to begin with a small number of courses uh, offered by each partner. And the economic fundamentals, I mean, the, the main driver of the OVR University Network, and we would be perfectly open and have the freedom to change the name, because I think it's something that we need to think about, and we collectively need the anchor partners on the table to have that debate. Um, but the significant fund of economic drivers here is um, that individual institutions participating in this network, no new money is required. There's not a new investment that institutions have to make because the investment is sunk in cost. And those of us that have a, a sort of an economic background know that when we're taking investment decisions for the future, not to be unduly influenced by sunk in cost. And the cost we as institutions incur in the development of our materials is really the academic and the professional learning design time that goes into those courses. Participating in the OER University Network doesn't require any new money. All it requires for selected courses is a switch in the intellectual property policy for those courses. And that doesn't cost anything. That costs nothing. So, what, so what's the benefit of doing that? Well, if we as 13 founding anchor partners can elaborate on building a collection of these things, it's significantly cheaper than any institution in the world trying to do this on their own. So the very nature of our network is we have competitive advantage. And uh, you know, folk often ask me and say, you know, Wayne, uh, what are you going to do if more institutions want to join? And you know, what happens if the whole world you know, joins the network? You're going to lose your competitive advantage. Uh, and I'm, I, my response to that is, now that's just fine, because our strategic mission is to mainstream the use of open educational resources at every single institution on the planet. And once we've achieved that, we've achieved a far more effective education system. And the beauty of the model is, until that point where we have every institution on board, our network has the competitive advantage, because we will be able to do it cheaper, faster, and of better quality than anybody else trying to do this on their own. Uh, I think the model is not just about open educational resources, but also support of the students in terms of moderation, and there is a cost in moderation. Um, but I haven't explored enough the notion of volunteer tutoring. Oh, and it's, 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 a, it's a very valid question. And what we are saying is if institutions incur real cost, 
around the services they're providing the learners within this network. That should be done on either a, a, a cost recovery, fee for service basis, or even perhaps for profit. There's, there's nothing wrong in doing it for profit um, either. Or perhaps uh, there are other funding sources where smart governments will begin to realize that they can have a more effective system if they start aggregating their funding formulas in a way that recognize, say, just an assessment services, the service around OER. And we certainly in New Zealand are very keen uh, to be having the discussions with our tertiary education funding uh, models uh, to actually start thinking of restructuring our funding formula uh, in ways um, that you know this model will work. And I know Phil has done some, some very high level costs. I mean, I know it's not a detailed cost, but you kind of got a gut feel for what the costing sort of ratio might be. And I, I wonder if you would like to comment on that, Phil. Yeah, well, I think it lies. <coughs> It's in a, still in a, a fairly wide range, but uh, between about 20 and 40 percent of the package that people currently buy. So this is, I think, this is the, the how I'm framing the issue. We just sell one package to people. Now you want a credential. You you buy this stuff here, which starts with enrolment, ends with graduation. You're going to get taught whether you like it or not. Within that is the assessment activity. Um, and I think it lies in that range, the actual cost of that. Um, I think about, for example, a carpentry program uh, where there is very regular <coughs> assessment type activity going on, um, even if it is more at the formative end than the summative end, uh, the, the, the trainees or the students uh, beavering away building their house, <coughs> uh, which, which we do here, they build real houses, uh, and someone is constantly uh, letting them know whether or not they're doing it right and uh, then in the end there is some form of summative assessment. On the other hand you go to the other end of the continuum, uh, might be a business course and uh, the amount of focused assessment activity is relatively minor. So I think we actually have to unpack uh, what's going on in, in each type of program but I think it's within that range um, and so you look at it this way, you, you say what we're doing in a traditional approach is we're simply constructing learning experiences for people. And we know that those can be constructed for people to follow for themselves. Um, you know, some of us can read um, manuals on, on how to do stuff and how to, um, you know, set up our TVs or whatever the case may be. We can read good manuals about how to go about this learning journey if that's how it's been structured for us. So the challenge, it seems to me, and the logical place to go, is to say that let's, let's come in at the point of you've had a learning experience. But we've been doing this with APL, with experiential learning, with what you've done on the job or in your life and as a volunteer. So why can't we just go into that frame and say, well, up there, out there, um, in the ether, there's a truckload of learning experiences that people have thought through and they've said if you follow this set of experiences, you're likely to come at the other end knowing and able to do a truckload of stuff. So I, I, I'm in the, the thinking space of just saying that all that stuff that we call teaching, we just say this is just learning experiences and when they're done, we'll apply an APL methodology to um, where to next. And uh, so I think the, the fee for that will be about 20% to a maximum of 40% um, of what we charge people to get the whole package. Now if we can persuade governments, uh, for those of us in constituencies where governments uh, provide a subsidy, to um, prorate the subsidy um, and we prorate the student fee, we're home and dry. The, the only downside to that at the moment in a constituency like New Zealand is we're, we're in a, a capped environment, so um, government funding wouldn't necessarily flow. I think we're talking about something where uh, it's one of those areas where the first movers will actually end up with a huge business advantage, but the sum of all the parts will destroy the whole. Um, it's the interesting thing, isn't it? Um, and therefore, before you get too many players on board, uh, you have to have a change at policy level, government policy level. But there, there is no danger for the for the early movers. 
the early movers can only attract new business. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Judith, now I've seen that you've got a lot of the triangles and things that help us clarify this. Oh, yeah. So perhaps you might want to get a drop. Yeah, I do. Okay. I think it would really help. Okay, so. Okay. With apologies to our virtual participants, you might not be able to see the drawing. But you'll hear it. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, oh, I should have raised that. Um, so at Thompson Rivers, we've kind of conceptualized um, uh, what we're doing in open learning. We built three life cycles. Um, we have a, a student life cycle all the way from inquiry to graduation. We have a um, open learning faculty member life cycle from hiring through to retirement or resignation. And we have a curriculum life cycle that goes all the way from an idea for a course or a program all the way through to the actual maintenance or retirement of that. And we built these three life cycles and we demonstrate them in a triangle um, because it's where those life cycles intersect, where we have an, a student working with our materials and our open learning faculty members, that that's where the learning, the education, and in essence, the credentialing. So it's our students working with our materials and working with our faculty to get education and, in essence, credentials. So when we've been rethinking and trying to look at where we think um, the potential is for open education 2.0 or the next evolution of open education, we, we looked at it in terms of this particular framework. And what we did was we looked at changing our triangle and recognizing that we could have any learner, right, any learner from anywhere who's working with any materials Right? Our, someone else's, um, you know, learning exp experience that's coming through learning or uh, experiential learning um, and working with any kind of support. Whether that's our faculty members, your faculty members, peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> support. And it's this new triangle or my reinvention of John Daniel's iron triangle, I call it something else. Um, it's this new triangle where, where we sit is in the middle. And we sit here where, again, we're assessing the learning to see that it has achieved our objectives to give our credit and our credential. So that's our thinking about open learning 2.0. I scribble, so. Okay, we've got um, just a few minutes left um, to wrap the session up. The one area that we haven't really touched on but has been raised is issues around technologies and and um, and the interrelationship between those and um, pedagogies and various other things. So if there's any particular questions or comments anyone has on the technology front. And it's good that it's at the end because I think we've discussed some really important stuff. <coughs> Jim, I know University of Southern Queensland had a particular question relating to, which I think is a very important question. So. One of the questions that I submitted on behalf of USQ was in relation to existing licensing agreements, uh, which are primarily based on the number of seats that we have, the number of students uh, who gain access, for example, to aggregated um, journal articles. Uh, it's a typical model around the provision of library resources. And similarly, if you use a learning ma management system other than Moodle or free one, uh, you typically have an agreement that you have so many students. So the issue there was if we attract more students to do our courses, um, how do we manage the existing agreements and will we have to pay extra, you know, a significant amount of renegotiation uh, to provide access to learning resources that are somehow tied with commercial agreement. So the suggestion that I made about that on the site was that we run, we're basing our courses solely on open educational resources when we design them pedagogy, whatever we do. So we can stay clear of the existing commercial agreement environment. Um, if we can run the courses on the Wiki Educator platform using Moodle, 
again, we can create an environment which is accessible for all and doesn't incur any additional licensing costs. So that was a proposal that I put forward to my colleagues and it was accepted as a good idea and it stayed clear of the minefield of existing licensing agreements which had a commercial dimension. And just, I mean, just to add to that, John, I think this is a very good example of why a network solution actually works well in generating cost savings within the institution. Because if you think about it, the only way to generate cost savings around course development is through the collaboration and use of OER. But in order to facilitate the network collaboration, every partner is using any number of technologies on campus. So uh, in order to get the advantage, you have to be technology neutral, technology transparent in, in a sense, and do this in a way that will work with every local institution's uh, learning management system or uh, administration system, and we'll show examples of that in terms of how this can be done. Uh, but the beauty of the model is uh, the OER university learner or student is lead in a legal sense and not a student of the host institution until the time that they request assessment and credentialing services, which then avoids the problem of chasing you know, the rising costs of licensing fees of, of, of local, <coughs> local software, which I think is an important feature of what you can achieve with a network model that you cannot do working alone. I can see some games here. <laughs> Is there a student management system where all this accreditation information will go that is open source and available? The, uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the answer is, as with all technology questions, yes and no. Um, and, and, and that's part of the model. I, mean, I think we've got to work with what we've got. Um, and, and so, for example, we'll design the model in a way that it works with the University of Canterbury systems. We have to. Because it's a, the model, the model needs the success of institutions. Uh, and, and, and without the success of institutions, the model doesn't function. And so, but over time, it, it will mature. Uh, and, we, we, and that's the beauty of the open source and free software model. I mean, it's tremendous flexibility in terms of what we can do. And hey, if there's some gaps, we can, we can fix them over time. Yeah, the, the, the discussion I was having with Wayne uh, recently was, of course, as we move forward on the timeline and we start to engage with these things that informs our thinking, when we're talking about things like refreshing our student management systems, we start to build features in that we never thought of in the old version. Now, it should have to us. And so as we go forward, those opportunities are always there um, to, to, you know, to build in the connections and the patches. Some pedagogists may, may vehemently oppose the use of the learning management system. system. And that's no, no, fine. no, no, no. Student management system for the information. I've got a comment on that because, again, at USQ, the issue about cost, you know, no new money, no new software modification, no customization of existing systems. And we have invested in a continuing professional development modularization as part of our system. And on our planning, we're able to accommodate an OERU student in that network. We have options where, um, for continuing professional development, students can do, say, a third of the course or a, a, a third of the subject and gain credit by paying an amount for that, and then it will accumulate into a, a whole credit and then be transferred into the system. So it is a real issue. Student management systems can kill this uh, unless we manage it. And I know that within our system we've got a, a model that will be potentially applicable to this, but I think we also need to depend on some initiative, and there are some happening at the moment where people are building on student management systems, and we need to hope that they will interface effectively you know, with our existing system, or that we can use them in parallel. So it's a key issue, and as with all innovations, you know, the administration can be a major challenge. Um, I, I just wanted to um, say that I, I think conceptually, um, the Open Education Resource University is um, somewhat simplistic. I think operationally, it's extremely complicated. And I think that um, 
We need to try and keep this as simple as possible. And we need to try to figure out where, what is um, a place where we can start, what's manageable and doable now, and try something and learn from that and figure out how we would evolve this. I think if we try to solve all these issues, um, and we bog down in trying to solve all these issues, we may not be able to get off of square one. Um, and we need to get off of square one in order to get to some of that. I think, um, I, again, I, I think it, at an operational level, this can become very, very complicated very quickly. Um, but it's also my understanding, and I may be incorrect, that we're not creating a degree-granting university here. That this is where students will access resources that we put in and services that we will um, provide or have available to them to then, for credit or credential, enter the university and its systems and its policies in order to get um, that credential. So, and as Judith, I can confirm, you're absolutely correct. The, the network, the area of tertiary educational network, is not a degree conferring institution. And it doesn't want to be one when it grows up either. Um, the degree granting institutions are accredited colleges, universities, and polytechnics in the national jurisdictions. And it, in my view, it needs to remain that way. Um, it's the only way the model can function. What I'd like to do is, is just finish on that note because it's a perfect ending that leads into our work this afternoon um, and streams and the things, presentations of a lot of various streams which will start to look at each of those and the notion of keeping this simple, starting small, identifying, as we said this morning in our objectives, a credential, some courses, and just work quietly on that and work out these issues. So I'd like to thank the panel for the input. Thank you very much everybody for the questions and people externally have also um, contributed and commented to the feedback. Um, Thank you for that. Um, we've now got a group photo. Uh, technically, I know we've got a group photo. I'm not entirely sure whether our photographer is going to arrive. Um, so as, as in the, the network, we, 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 we want to improvise and maybe just slot in a time tomorrow um, for the photo. But before we break for lunch, I, I, I just do want to recognize and, and, and welcome uh, Mark Hill or Mark uh, Brown, uh, who's the director of distance education. I hope I get the title right. But he's a very senior person leading open learning at uh, New Zealand's distance teaching university, Massey University. So Mark, maybe I just want to say one or two words. I know you had previous commitments and weren't able to write sooner. And hopefully the backlight is not going to be too much of a problem to the web feed. Well, I won't say much, it's just welcome, thanks for um, allowing me to be here. Massey's kind of here as an observer, I have to say. Um, and I've got quite a number of roadblocks that have come up, and, and I guess that's why we're here, is because we want to actually hear what we have, what the answers are to what those roadblocks might be. <laughs> Things such as accreditation, um, <clears throat> which is a huge driver internationally, and particularly in terms of the recognition of a degree. Uh, and things such as the, you know, the administration stuff, because when we start saying that this is no cost to a university, it's actually an enormous cost to a university. Um, even just changing an IP policy is an enormous cost to a university. <laughs> so I guess you know, we're here, we're not wanting to be naysayers at all, so uh, we're very willing and as an institution have a huge commitment to access to education, but um, at this point in time, we, we're still you know, thinking about the implications. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, and then we'll break. We'll see if it's a And we're back again for, uh, in an hour's time, I believe. Um, yes, that's great. <laughs>